Greetings, welcome to Learn to Burn Studios. In today's video, I'm gonna show you how to do a ceramic shell investment for your PLA and wax patterns with the goal of ultimately casting these things in metal. So in today's video, I want to show you how, uh, how to do a ceramic shell investment. Ceramic shell is a combination of two components, basically. There's the ceramic shell slurry, which ultimately is a combination of silica flour and colloidal, or silica colloidal, silica flour. Ultimately, this is all silica. So, um, and then ultimately uh, different grades of sand or stucco. And so what we want to do is we're going to take our, our, our patterns that have been uh, sprued up. And if you need some insight on sprueing, uh, you can check out some links above and, and in the description uh, for some of those previous videos. But once we have our pattern sprued up, we're going to dip them into the slurry, let the excess drain off, and then we're going to dust them with different grades of stucco. That's ultimately what a single dip is going to be. A typical shell is roughly about 10 dips. The first three coats are our primary coats. That's what's going to capture the detail, surface texture of, of our, our patterns. And then ultimately, then there's going to be six coats of coarse material, our backup coats, and then finally a slurry coat. And out of that 10 dips, it's like on that sequence of dipping will cover the majority of what you're going to cast, especially if you're dealing with about a, something that's going to hold it roughly about, you know, 20 to 25 pounds of metal. But if we're going to, and then above that, we might add an extra dip or more, add some reinforcement. And we'll talk about those different contingencies or, or variations in the shell as we get through the process. But for what we're going to do in dipping these skulls that we've been talking about all this time, yeah, kind of just sprued up, Sim simply sprued, just a simple cup, gate, vent, and the pattern itself. Now this, this object is pretty straightforward because it's you know spherical in nature, the skull itself. Um, there's very few kind of hard edges. Um, there are times where if you have a long linear edge, say, say if, you're, if we were doing a box, something or a cube, something with hard edge and stuff like that, those sharp edges were, would re, be referred to as a hydraulic edge. You know, basically when the metal slams into it, it's gonna you know, hit that sharp point and literally create almost like an ax blade that could potentially slice through your shell. So those are elements in the shell that are areas in the shells that we would typically want to add reinforcement to, to beef them up and to make them uh, more durable so they're less susceptible to that situation. But again, we're, we don't really have that condition on this, this project, so, so to speak, but we will, uh, I will be doing other shapes um, and videos on those um, at, moving forward. And we will talk about all those different conditions as. Um, as they uh, come up. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna move forward uh, with this pattern. Majority of the techniques I'm gonna talk about today in this video are fairly universal to regardless of the type of slurry you're using. There are a, a, a variety of different mixtures, different configurations of slurry, and whether you're mixing your own or whether you're buying a, a pre-mixed slurry solution, the, the approach is, is, is similar, if not just is outright the same. Out of the silicas that we have a choice of, the, you know, we can do our ceramic shell in using alumina and molite, but really the silica that I prefer to use is the fused silica. And so for our, our, my entire slurry system, everything's pretty much fused silica based with one exception. My first coat of stucco is, I actually use a, prefer a zircon sand because of its density um, and its ability to withstand the potential burn-in uh, from the higher temperatures of when I'm casting iron. An example of just how dense the zircon is compared to the fused silica is that e very easily we can see by the, the size of the bags. You know, if, when you compare the two, the zircon bag is literally one-third the size of the 55-pound few silica bag, just really indicating that, you know, just how much more dense that material is. One of the, you know, additional perks of using the zircon, you know, we want to use it for our first coat in the sand. One of the reasons why it, you know, aside from it just being, you know, extra dense and being able to handle those hotter temperatures of, of certain metals is that the grain profile 
of the, sil or the zircon sand is that it's actually rounded, not crystalline like the fused silica. And by being rounded, when we use it on that first coat, it's not gonna push through that layer of slurry and it's not going to obscure or create aggressive texture that might interfere with our, the textures of our pattern. But yet it's, it's still um, angled enough that it will interlock and bind appropriately with the, the next layer of slurry and uh, fine coat stucco. Okay, so next I wanna show you, you know, we talk, I talk about mesh size or grain size, in particular for the stuccos, and the challenge of getting them to intermix or inter, interlock is st stay in sequence. Now to show you the difference in the different grains, we'll do it this way. So we have a zircon, our number one, and our number two. Or in this case, zircon sand, 5100, 3050. And so when we first look at this material, we have our zircon. You can see where it's super fine to the point where it's falling you know, right into the crevices and fingerprints textures of my, of my hand. That's how fine these products are. And when we feel this stuff, it actually, it doesn't, it's not as smooth as glass bead. It definitely has a little bit of a bite to it, but comparatively to the other two stuccos, it's fairly smooth. Now when we look at the number one, so okay, so we have our number two, and they look real similar, but where the, really where the difference is, is this stuff is definitely a thicker grain, but it, it's, a, it's a rougher texture, a coarser texture. Has a little bit dip, more of a bite to it. Now I realize that the, these are, you know, it's subtle. So we have our number one and we have our zircon but maybe you can see how much more this is kind of like filtering into the crevices of my skin as opposed to the number one stucco, which obviously sits up a little bit more on the surface. And then with the difference between this, that, we'll start off with a little bit of the fine, and then with the coarse, you can see where this is definitely a little bit bigger as opposed to this. So, you know, this isn't going to filter into the crevices of my skin at all. It's just going to sit right up on the surface. But you can see where there's a better, you know, this is a nice even transition. And ultimately, I don't have the extra coarse, the 3050. I don't use that. Um, and if you do see it, it looks almost like a cat litter. Um, as far as the, you know, the granules of it is. So anyway, but I just wanted to kind of put that out there so you can sort of see the difference between the different grain sizes. You know, we've talked about our mesh size, grain size of our stuccos, but really what it comes down to is laying down the appropriate stucco at the beginning. And in this case, our zircon, or if you don't have zircon, just doing a slurry only coat. But the key is to, depending on what your you know level of detail is texture that you have on your pattern you want to apply you know the, the smaller grains first until you have a chance to really kind of dumb down really fill in all those deep nooks and crannies and typically three prime coats is more than enough to do that but if you have something that's really deep you know or you have something that has a large larger cavity and whatnot you want to fill up these cavities with you know the, the smaller grains before you jump up to the next level grain or the next level you know stucco if you don't you're going to want to create gaps so like if we're looking at and this is obviously an exaggeration we're not dealing with something you know say this big but if we're dealing with something like this and you got small grains the size of peas you know if you jump into something that is more like the size of a marble it's going to get stuck up in this upper cavity be, and wind up leaving air bubbles and gaps um, or voids in the, in the ceramic shell material that could potentially fill in with positive metal that will translate as additional cleanup on your castings. When we jump from, say, the zircon sand up to the, you know, to the fine coat, to the coarse, or much less if you're jumping all the way up to an extra coarse, 
you want to be systematic in how you're going through your co your coach. You don't want to jump from say zircon to the 50/30 course or jumping from the fine co fine coats up to um, the the extra course. You need to make you know even if you only do one coat of uh, one material to create a transition, and so those grains can actually transition and interlock uh, appropriately together so you can still maintain a very solid, uh, durable shell. And so when I'm using the zircon sand for, say, an iron shell, I do two coats of zircon, one coat of the fine, or the 5100 fused silica, and then the, you know, the, the rest of my coarse coats. What I found is that by using the zircon just on my first coat for my bronze and my aluminum castings, I'm just getting some super sweet detail. And so, um, that's what I've started. Yeah, that's how I do it. So, so I'll use a, a single coat of zircon, and then ultimately two coats of fine, 5100, and then ultimately again backing them up with the coarse coats at 3050. Okay. So as we get ready to start our dipping cycle, like I said, we're going to do you know 10 dips. So we're going to you know focus on this first dip, and really you know if you think about it, the first dip is really the one where we capture the detail. I have my slurry mixing, as you can hear um, in the background. Yeah. As we've talked about in previous videos, I use a slurry with a suspension agent, so my mixer doesn't mix 24-7. I have it, you know, I turn it on for about five minutes ten, you know, or so be before each dip, and then otherwise my uh, tank actually sits uh, stationary. So with that said, we can go ahead and, you know, turn this off so you can hear me a little bit better. So with this, using this material, I do want to use rubber gloves, um, so let me put those on, and then um, and ideally, I, you know, I've, I've emphasized, you know, several times that, you know, with all the silica in the air, we really need to be wearing respirators. Okay, so we're, you know, we're, we're ready to go. Our slurry's mixed up. Let me remove the lid here. And so, like I said, we want to capture our detail. You know, clean off your wax. You know, you can actually rinse these things off a little bit or even use a little bit of a degreaser at times. Um, as we've said before, depending on your slurry, uh, my slurry actually has a, well, what's referred to as a wetting agent in it, uh, which will allow this, this water-based slurry sticking, to stick to my oil-based wax. If you have a, a more standard or traditional colloidal, or a, if you have a more traditional slurry, then you're going to want to coat your waxes and your gates with a mixture of sh shellac and denatured alcohol. It's typically a 50-50 mixture, works out just, just, just fine. And what that does is it creates just a little bit of a tooth to your wax surface to, that will allow the, the water-based slurry to actually stick to it. That's just one extra step depending on what your slurry is, wh which specific slurry you're using. Also, several of the uh, pre-mixed slurries are is my understanding that they also have a wetting agent in them um, to help them stick to the waxes. So with that said, what we want to do is that we don't want to just, you know, jam this thing right into uh, the slurry. We want to, you know, introduce it to the slurry as slowly as possible, allowing the slurry to lap up and around the surface. You know, you think about it, it's like on, if you, you know, if you jump into the pool or a bathtub a little too quickly and you'll notice that you, there's a lot of air bubbles sticking to your skin and that sur it, they, they cling to that surface tension. And so the same kind of thing can happen in, with the slurry. So for this first dip, I'm really only just worry, worrying about my, the pattern itself. I'm not worried about the detail of my gating and my cup. So I'm going to pull it out and let it, the excess drain back into the tank. And you don't want to have the piece just consistently in one position. You want to, you know, roll it around because we're trying to establish a nice even coat. And that's really what our, you know, our goal is on each dip is to create as evenly even coat as possible. Now you can see even on this first coat, you can still see the, the darkness of the wax just a little bit. And then one thing I'm going to do is grab a brush. This is just a natural fiber chip brush. 
disposable brush, although it'll last through this whole thing. So because of you know the, the voids in the, the eyes and the nose cavity, those didn't quite, they captured air when I plunged the, the face straight down. So I'm just gonna grab some extra slurry, make sure I have some good, good adhesion. I'm gonna drag the brush just slightly over the teeth. That's our most detailed area of this pattern. And it's not so much that I want to like, like gessoing a canvas, you know, work the material, really work the material in there. It's more of a light, you know, stippling action. A combination of popping the air bubbles, working it into the details. Ideally let it drain back into the bucket, not onto the floor. I also have some cranial ridges. I wanna make sure my coat is in here. Another uh, contingency that we want to you know, discuss briefly is, okay, so I'm using the Zircon stucco as my first coat, and I'll show that here in a second. But if you don't have Zircon, it's fine. To capture the fine detail, actually what you'll do for your first coat is slurry only. Technically, I, you know, I do know some people that will do the, the 5100 stucco on their first coats. Um, but it doesn't always happen, but there's a, a chance that that stucco could push through the, the first layer of slurry and you'll pick up a rougher texture more similar to the, to the grain size of the stucco. So to, to really capture your best detail, it's ideal to just do a slurry only coat and then do two to three coats of fine material for, before jumping up to your coarse coats. Now the challenging thing with that is that it, the material itself can actually if you leave it too long before your second coat sometimes and if and or if your waxes aren't perfectly clean that that first slurry only coat can crack and peel off the surface so you know which can you know it, it's, it can be a challenge sometimes so that's why I've, I've opted to start using the zircon material on that first coat because it just gives me it really locks in that detail the first time out without too much fuss and then for this first coat we're going to use the zircon stucco. I'm going to use a small little sieve, similar to what you would use for like powdered sugar and dusting your, you know, dusting your Danish. And I'm using this because ultimately there's inherently, you know, you can see where the still is actually just dripping a little bit. Those drips, you know, create little, you know, boogers and chunks in the slurry or in, into the stucco. So to sift those out, and to make sure none of those actually come in contact with the surface here, I'm just going to lightly sift the sand through the sieve, making sure I have just the smallest amount of material actually hitting the surface to capture my detail. Now you do want to be careful that this thing is if your slurry is still, you know, you had too much slurry on the surface. This stuff is so dense, it will actually grab a hold of the slurry and, and almost pull it off the, off the piece or make some drips and whatnot, which actually I just did, but I'll show you how to smooth that out here in a second. So I just want to make sure I have a pretty good even overall coat. And ultimately here you can see where I got some kind of some drip action happening and stuff. So all I'm going to do is kind of just pat that down. Just going to add a little, you know, little extra material. We just want to, you know, like again, our goal on every dip is to try to maintain as even a coat as possible. But at the same time, if there's a little irregularity, it's not going to throw off the shell um, in any you know, real negative way. It's just a premise of like one, ideally we want to do our best to capture things as consistently as possible. And so, there we go. Fairly nice even coat. At this point, I'm gonna put them in front of the fans on this on the drying rack as a whole, I have several fans coming in from either side, fans coming down from the top and up from the bottom to try to create enough turbulence and airflow to evenly dry the shells. 
And as we've noted earlier, the way I sprue these things is both a combination of what's most efficient for the wax to drain out, the metal to flow in, but also in, by sprueing it in this position, as I set them on the rack here, it opens up this volume so it captures the air coming off the fan to evenly dry the inside core as, long, as well as at the same time as getting a nice even airflow around the exterior of the piece. Okay, so now that we have talked about what we're, you know, what we're working with, with our, you know, chemicals, our different silicas, our different approach, our different techniques, we've gotten through our first dip. And so this will conclude the first part of this series on how to dip a ceramic shell. So stay tuned for part two. It'll be uploaded here shortly. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. And until then, be creative and be safe.